welcome to Europe PCR 2018. It's my great pleasure to be here with Andrew Sharp from Exeter in the UK and with David Kanzari from Atlanta in the USA. Um, we have an interesting meeting. Uh, one of the hot topics here definitely is uh, renal denovation back on track. Hopefully we'll have to discuss that during our discussion. And now, Andrew, probably many of you who are listening now were asking themselves, what is different with these new trials that have been presented here at EuroPCR? Well, they're a completely different design over the ones that have went before. So although these are sham control trials, similar to the HTN3 concept, the patient population, the catheter that's been used in order to denovate these patients, and the mechanism of conducting the trial and controlling for the variables that may have affected previous trials has been really quite rigorous and extensive. So uh, at this meeting, we've uh, seen the results of spiral on. Spiral on is part of a stable of, of studies. So we had spiral off a year ago, which was looking at patients on no drugs at all. They were taken off their drugs or they were patients who hadn't yet started drugs. 80 patients were presented last year and it showed a significant blood pressure fall of about 10 millimeters off office blood pressure and five millimeters off ambulatory blood pressure. That was a patient population without any antihypertensive With no drugs. drugs at all in moderate hypertension. What we're seeing at this meeting is a similar moderate hypertensive population, but this time on drugs. So Spiralon uh, presented data of six month outcomes in 80 patients who were randomized one to one to either treatment with the spiral renal denovation catheter or a sham procedure where we did a renal angiogram on the patient and then did not tell them whether or not they'd had their procedure. So double blinded? Double blinded. Can you say something about the catheter that has been used there? It's a different catheter from what went before. So that, as you know, the first generation Simplicity catheter was like a finger. We steered it like an old EP catheter and we pointed it into the wall and we tried to draw a spiral ourselves, which had some variability to it. I think there's no doubt about that. Um, the spiral catheter is a nice and old catheter. We delivered it over a wire into the renal artery. We pull that wire back and then the catheter springs into a spiral shape and automatically has four electrodes at north, south, east and west that will oppose into the wall and form the shape that we want, which is a staggered spiral. It's not all in one round place. It, it's staggered across the length of the vessel. And that allows us to guarantee a circumferential ablation, which is what we're after. We need to get the whole vessel denovated. David, you are one of the PIs. You presented the paper and the publication here at uh, one of the hotline sessions. Yes. Could you summarize what the main findings were? So it's been an exciting time for us here at EuroPCR. And just very briefly, just to expand on, on Andrew's comments and description of the trial, based on the lessons learned that Andrew described, this was a study performed in patients with moderate uncontrolled hypertension. So the inclusion criteria were that the office systolic blood pressure ranged from approximately 150 to 180 with a diastolic blood pressure of at least 90. The ambulatory 24-hour blood pressure systolic was between 140 and 170. And the patients were taking one to three commonly prescribed antihypertensive agents. So a thiazide diuretic or a calcium channel blocker or an ACE inhibitor or ARB or a beta blocker. So quite commonly prescribed medications in practice. And based on the experience and successes of clinically relevant and significant reductions in the off-meds population, the intent here was to study renal denervation in the context of these commonly prescribed medications, but still persist in uncontrolled hypertension. And what we observed in this study is that compared with the sham control, renal denervation was associated with quite significant and meaningful reductions in essentially every blood pressure measure, by ambulatory blood pressure and by office blood pressure at six month follow-up. Just as an example, over 24 hours for the systolic ambulatory blood pressure, the blood pressure was reduced nine millimeters mercury in the renal denervation group, and in the sham control group, essentially expectedly no change, 1.6 millimeters mercury. This again was a highly statistically significant difference. What we also observed in the trial are some other insightful findings to the potential benefits and distinctive effects of renal denervation therapy. The first is that over at baseline, at three months and follow-up, we performed 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure assessments, and we observed a progressive decline in the blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic, by ABPM from three months to six-month follow-up. And then further, over the 24-hour period, in comparison to the sham control group, which essentially had no change, renal denervation was associated with a persistent suppression 
over all time intervals, daytime, nighttime, and it raises this concept of an always-on effect of renal denervation therapy. And this may be quite relevant in its distinction to the pharmacokinetic okay. properties yeah. of drugs that have their trough levels in early morning or late evening hours. And secondly, in relationship to individuals at high risk for adverse events related to hypertension, such as those with nocturnal hypertension or with early morning hypertension. And then finally, it may have relevance in this issue that we could talk much, much further about of, of adherence and non-adherence. Yeah. And we, we monitored yeah. non-adherence and adherence in this trial by blood and urine chemistries. And we did it at baseline at three months and at six months. And interestingly, we observed that about 40% of the patient population, despite their knowledge of testing for adherence, had either incomplete or complete non-adherence at some different time point. And it was highly dynamic. It changed over time, whereas a patient could be adherent at baseline, but non-adherent at three, at, at, at three months and then adherent again at six months. A very complex issue, right? Very. very. It's a science unto itself. Right. Yeah. yeah right. Um, Andrew, you mentioned that we used a different catheter, but we not only used a different catheter, yeah. a multi-electrode catheter, yeah. we also embarked on a new procedural right. technique, actually going into the branches, yeah. being more active, having more ablations, yeah. being performed in the smaller arteries distal to the bifurcation. Were there any safety issues that popped up in this trial? We've seen none to date. We've seen zero safety issues from the first trial, spiral off, 80 patients. We've seen no safety issues in spiral on at this meeting, so that's another 80 patients, 160. I know that in the GSR registry you've looked at safety information on over 300 patients who've had the same new technique. And so far we haven't seen any signals of any problems. I think that's extremely encouraging. We'll need to see that in larger trials, of course. Uh, what you're talking to is a, a difference between the first major renal denervation trials of denervating 11, 12 ablations. Now we're looking at four times that many. Uh, and that's partly because the spiral catheter itself can more efficiently deliver safely spaced lesions. So we're getting more ablations into the main renal artery and then we're uh, selecting each of the branches that's above three millimeters and delivering denervations to those arteries outside of the renal parenchyma. And I, you understand more than anybody the science behind this, that we, we understand that the nerves as they come off uh, the side of the aorta, they, they start from reasonably far away from the vessel approximately and they come in to be very close to the branches. So as we deliver denervations distally, we're having a higher likelihood of achieving a complete denervation and therefore the hope of a clinical response. So we proved efficacy, no safety issues yeah. up until today. But what is the next step, David? What, where are we moving to? What, are the, what is the future of renal denervation? What are the future investigations looking like? So altogether, uh, the consistency in the findings with both the off-meds experience and now the on-meds experience, I think, number one, reassure us regarding the safety of the procedure that Andrew described. Secondly, highlight the reproducibility of this specific procedure of main artery as well as branch denervation and further take us to the next level of larger trials and larger confirmatory trials that would lead ideally to regulatory approval but also inform clinical practice. And specifically, we're now in an ongoing study, the larger pivotal off-meds pr uh, protocol in which we're evaluating renal denervation therapy similarly in the absence of antihypertensive medications to our first phase of the trial. This is a study that will help further inform the treatment of uncontrolled hypertension, but in the again, absence of medications, and we're very much in the planning, along with both of you, in the design and conduct of a larger confirmatory trial in the presence of medications as well. Exciting times for renal denervation. We are moving that technology to a next level. And much more to come. I would like to thank you both for discussing this interesting topic with us and uh, with me, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you.